Boom, everybody. What's up? Welcome to Taught Leaders Lesson 10. I am Keenan, author of Not Taught, What It Takes to Be Successful in the 21st Century. If you fig haven't figured it out, things have changed. What your mama taught you, what your daddy taught you, what they taught you in school to be successful does not carry the weight and panache it once did. Things have changed. It's because the information age is here. Taught Leaders is all about bringing in the experts like our guest today, Ms. Shama Haider, about how to execute across all the chapters in the book. And today's chapter is about brand you. One of the biggest and most fundamental changes in the information age is the idea that we have to build our own brand. So we have to have a brand like that of a cereal box on the shelf at the grocery store. So I'm super excited and thrilled to introduce Shama Haider. Shama, what's up, sister? Welcome. Hey, Keenan. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. We met at HubSpot, HubSpot last year, did we not inbound? We did, yes. Yes, and Heidi is sassy. I thought I was sassy, but Heidi was sassy. <laughs> we, were in the same, we were in the same green room together, and there was there was a lot of lot of ego in that room. We're sassy and back and forth, and I was like, I really like this girl. She's got she's got sass, she's got panache, she's, she's smart, and so I knew one of these days we would be doing this. So, oh, thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. So everybody who does not know, Shama is the author of two great books. I'm going to butcher this because one, her first one, The Zen of Marketing. Did I get it right? The Zen of Social Media Marketing, yeah. Yeah, Social Media Marketing, yes, which is awesome. I wanted to hear that story coming in. And her newest one, which I was just reading, and I can't remember the, tell us the name, Marketing in Momentum. That's it. Dang. That's a pretty book, Momentum. <laughs> Tell us about Momentum, Shama. Tell us about it. Yeah, you know, it's really funny. I think to be able to tell you about Momentum, I have to talk a little about Zen and, <laughs> and how they, they relate, right? So when I wrote, I wrote the Zen initially based on demand, very like basic. There was no book out there for social media implementation. There's just nothing. There was nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> not, not like it is on Amazon today. And so I wanted to provide a guide for people. I wanted to create something tactical that people could look at, that they could, you know, have some sort of guide, a primer to the world of social media. And, you know, I, I wrote that book. I never expected it to do as well as it did, honestly, because I should, <laughs> I've I'd never been an author before. I hadn't thought this through, like, you know, book, game plan, and so forth. But it, it has. I mean, it's going into its fourth edition now, actually, coming out in a month. Um, the, so yeah, the fourth edition will be out in a month and it's used as a textbook to teach social media in college classes all over the world. So that's been unexpected and, and, and lovely. Um, you know, but it's funny because once I wrote that book, what happens is when you write a book and, and it does well, is the question that you get asked is when's your next book? Like mm -hmm. that is what everybody wants mm -hmm. to know. It's like, and I'm sure you, you've de dealt with this, you know, King people like mm -hmm. read the book and they're like, I want more. Right. When's mm -hmm. when's the next book? And, and so I had publishers, I had agents, I had sort of everyone saying like, OK, we know you can do this. So, you know, let's <laughs> let's do this again. And I, the, what I, I couldn't kind of sort of get over myself was, you know, I didn't want to write something for the sake of writing it. I like that was, yeah. you know, and it was like, can I write a book? Yes. Will I feel like it's what needs? I don't know. You know, and I, I'm an entrepreneur. To me, it's about filling market demand. And so. I was like, people still need Zen. And so for a long time, they needed Zen. And of course, a group of people still definitely need that today. I mean, like I said, it's a primer. It's really meant to be a tactical guide. But then, you know, like you can, when I'm out keynoting and meeting clients and, and doing work with eat, like all the stuff and working with my, you know, with my team and my agency, you, you sort of come across certain challenges, right? And so I started mm -hmm. to see certain things, certain patterns and then I realized, okay, no, no one's addressing these patterns. No one's talking about this. So it was just like Zen again, where I was like, yeah. okay, we're at kind of a new point now because I think we've gone from a point of like, you know, how do you use the tools? Because Zen is a lot about the tools and how do you use them to, okay, we live in a new ecosystem now. It's not just about the tools. It's kind of how, you know, I mean, you, you joked about this earlier, you know, just this is not your daddy's. <laughs> digital age this is not your parent i mean this is a different world we live in completely um and i think to that end is is why i wrote momentum you know it's about transforming your brand and furthering it in the digital age um and and so yeah so i think to tell the story of momentum i kind of have to tell the story of zen and show how i wrote it based on 
what we were seeing. Um, so yeah, it's it's been it's been a fun ride. Without, it came out in May, correct? It came mm -hmm. out in May. Yeah, it just, uh, yeah it came out late May. So it's 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 just it's just been out. So folks, I highly recommend you go get it, particularly if you're an entrepreneur, particularly if you run a business or you're responsible for a marketing organization. Go get it. Learn from Ms. Shama. Now, I want to take us back for a second. Right? Mm -hmm. And I want to take us to when you got out of college and you had a decision okay. to make. The, uh, what do they got? The Great Recession was going on. Tell us yes. that story. Yeah, it's funny. You know, I, I think some people know this, but not everyone doesn't know this. I did my thesis on Twitter when it had a few thousand users. And this is 07, 07 like really early days, you know, this is where people still said, um, you know, what's the bluebird? Which cartoon is that? Like if you wore it on a t-shirt, you know, and so yeah, um, yeah. before Snapchat, before Instagram. So a very different world. And I thought I would do what you're supposed to do when you graduate, which is go get a job. Um, except the problem with me wanting to get a job was that the industry that I was passionate about didn't exist. So it's not that the jobs didn't exist, the industry didn't exist. I mean, I, you know, I thought I would go the Bain McKinsey consulting route and I and I spoke to these partners at these events that you know they would come out to recruit from and uh, you know they would look and be like, what's Twitter? What <laughs> you know, uh, what what's you know, like Facebook, that's my like my 13 year old uses like, what are you talking? You know, it was just it did like it did not make sense. And so that's when I had, I guess, a decision to make. And, and frankly, I thought an entrepreneur sounded a lot better than unemployed to my parents to be able to <laughs> tell their friends, you know, here's, here's your kid, you just graduated with a graduate degree, 4.0, oh, and unemployed. Like, no, entrepreneur, yay. Um, <laughs> so you know, I, I joke, but it's funny because even though the big corporations at the time weren't on board, small businesses were like, uh, we're struggling, this can help, do it, whatever, do your little mumbo jumbo, you know? And so our best case studies initially were from small businesses who were not afraid to try new things, who were just like, hey, we're game, if you can help us grow, we're, we'll do it. And so from that point, we grew it. And honestly, we've, we've never looked back. Uh, we started out like social media consulting, today we're a web marketing digital PR firm, because again, also evolved based on needs, not based on like what I wanted to do or what, you know, what we thought it was all client feedback. So now we actually kind of work with, you know, fast growing startups or a lot of middle market companies, but companies that are successful that want to be at the pinnacle. So they want to be like recognized household names. They want to be the recognized industry thought leaders. And I guess that's what we do. And we do it through digital marketing. But so that has changed so much through it too in the in the years. And mm -hmm. so momentum was really about, okay, what are the principles that we use to apply to these clients? What are, you know, and so a lot of case studies, a lot of best practices. Like I'm very, I'm very tactical. I know you are too, Keenan. Like I got that about you is that like, what can I do with this information? You know what I mean? Great. Give me all this theory, but like, how do I apply it? What does it mean yeah. for me? And so even when I speak to me, it's like, okay, what can you do as soon as you leave the room? And like that's that's what I get value out of as a as a yeah, reader, as yeah. a listener. So to me, as a creator of content across the board, um, that's that's how I think about it too. All right. So so you did so you did well. You did a number of things, but one of the things you did from the book is you took risks, right? So I have a whole chapter in about risks, and maybe we have you come back and talk that because I don't think we uh, I don't think we've done a taught lesson a taught leaders on risk yet, and that's a really big one. I think a lot of people are afraid of. So you, this has spurred me. That chapter is one of my favorite. Um, but you also had to go out and build this identity of brand for yourself. And I have to believe that you leveraged both the social media marketing strategies that you use for organizations for personal brand perspective. Mm -hmm. Is that yes? And, and talk a little bit about how you did that and we'll go deeper with that. Yeah. So, you know, it's been very strategic because I have, I have, um, we have clients who we do this, what we do, the personal branding side for me, we, we have clients where we do the corporate, but then we work with their C-level execs to, to do that as well, because it's funny, they'll be like, you've been around, you know, one tent, like our company's been around for so long, but you have more of a digital footprint than we do. Or, you know, like nobody knows, like me as CEO of this, <laughs> you know, like billion dollar company. And, you know, aside from the occasional like press clipping, but you manage to build this brand. And I always tell them because I've, I've been very strategic about building both brands. It's not been accidental. I've invested in it as if it's two brands because they are to me, there's the company brand 
And then my brand, which there's overlap, certainly, right? But my brand, the company brand is digital marketing. What do we do for our clients? Getting companies known as, as you know, becoming household names, making them recognized industry experts in their field. That's what the company does. What I do is a lot broader, right? So I do marketing, but also I'm entrepreneurship is a passion. I'm an angel investor. I'm a keynote speaker. I'm an author. I, 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 so my company, while we might serve a few hundred clients, my brand, we have, you know, a reach of over a million across our different platforms. And so that's the audience that that brand is catering to. Right. So the, we, have, we have and and while marketing Zen is more we work with companies, the Shama brand, if you will, we have a lot of different audiences, a lot of young professionals, students, you know, <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. all people from all sorts of walks of life. So they are two different brands. But, yeah, I think you have to be if, if that is the direction you want to go, you have to have an end goal and you have to be very strategic in how you go about building that. OK, so you say if do you honestly believe in your heart? that anybody who wants to be successful today, who's under 30, because look, there are some people in their mid thirties and forties, just for sure, who've had enough momentum mm -hmm. that they can coast to the finish line. But do you think anybody under 30, and most people today can actually be successful without a brand? Well, I, let's, I'll put it this way. Everyone has a de facto brand, De right? facto, yes. You yes. have a de facto brand already. So like every single person, Unless you've been living off the grid and even then iffy, right? Because mm -hmm. what's your brand? If I type in your name, it's all the stuff I find about you. Like you have a brand. You it yeah. might be, it might not be um the only question that you get to ask yourself, and I think this is yeah, for people under 30, over 30, the only question you get to ask yourself is how much do I want to try and define this, right? Like I have a digital footprint. Do I want to actively, proactively curate one that's positive and works for me? Or do I want to let it be defined by other people? Because the only choice you don't have is like, do you, it's like, do you have a, you know, do I have a brand or not? Like, no, that's not the question, right? <laughs> you have a brand. Yes, Everybody right. has yes. a brand. You know, it's so funny. I love how you said that because when I talk a lot about corporate culture, I say the exact same thing. I said, you have a culture. You yeah. can't escape culture. So either you've defined that culture and it's a good one, or it's been, mm -hmm. a, as you said, de facto, I say, oh, you've defaulted to a culture, but they exist. Yeah. So why yeah. not control it? So I think you nailed it. So, so, but there are a lot of people out there who, who even if they buy into this idea that said, oh, I, I have a de facto one, but it really doesn't matter. Let's take a next step and talk about how and why should people commit to building one and what does that look like you said you were very strategic what would you tell or what do you tell people who are just starting in this path so i would say know your goals and know that those goals will change so when i was starting out i was strategic in that i wanted to to share my my thoughts right my expertise i wanted a platform for myself and the goal for that was to be able to reach more people to have a greater audience gives me so I think, okay, it's really funny because I think personal brand building is very similar to anything else that you do in life, like go through college. Any, you do all these things. And I was having this conversation with my sister too. And it's like, what do parents even want for their kids? They want, every parent wants the same thing for your kids. I don't care where you're from. I don't care what your background is. You want them to have choices. You want them to have opportunities, right? You want them to be able to choose in life. And the way you get to choose in life is by having a certain amount of power to make those choices. And what I mean by that is let's take a really simple example. Let's say that you are an accountant, right? You're working in an accounting firm and you at some point feel like you've hit a dead end at your job. You like it, but you know, it's where do you go from there? Where do you go from there? Ideally, if you've built a good personal brand, people know you in your field. You work hard to cultivate that, right? So yeah. now you have opportunity, you have choice. And so I think that's really the power of a personal brand is it gives you opportunity. It gives you choices. It's amazing. Like when I started to build my personal brand, I had certain goals and they were, they were broad as in, I want to do, you know, I enjoy speaking. I do a lot of keynote speaking. Like I love connecting with an audience like that. And I know you do too, Keenan. Like we love that, you know, on being on stage and, and that's a beautiful thing to have. And I knew I wanted that, but building that has opened up so many opportunities. I never envisioned. I just did videos for at and Small Business. I was a Verizon Small Business Ambassador at South by Southwest. I just gave a workshop at the Yale School of Management. 
I didn't go to Yale. <laughs> I'm no <laughs> Ivy right, Leaguer. Right. I went to state school. Yeah. Hook them. So, right, right. you know, but that's what building a platform does. It gives you opportunities beyond some that you might have envisioned and others that you that you've never even dreamt of. But I think that's the power of it. It's it's the ability to give you options. Even when we work with our CEOs, you know, we've, for example, one of our clients, he's um, at the helm of a $40 million company. It's privately held. And what he's really trying to do is he wants to build, he's working with us to create that right platform and brand for him and his company, where in the future, let's say he wants to be on board, you know, um, as a as an advisor on boards. He wants to be able to invest in things, but that means the opportunities have to come to him because the best ones mm-hmm. usually go to people there. You know, it's an interesting dynamic. So he knows that he's got to think like, you know, so even though he's in his fifties and he's CEO of this company, he's not looking at this saying like, Oh, okay, great. You know, he's really looking at this as far he's really looking at the, the arc of where I want options. Right. So here's a guy who, is very successful by all means, but even he's thinking about all right. What's what? What do I want that's next for me? I may decide to say CEO all my life and, and retire at this level, but I want options. I want maybe you know board positions. I want to be able to you know work on nonprofits. So I think having a platform is is important. It gives you a voice. I think everyone has something to say, um, and so I like I to me personal branding is not self. Um, self-serving or gratuitous i like i think people sometimes to me that's so insane i'm like uh so you have a platform you have an audience and you have power to do good and that's you know that's gratuitous i think that's insane yeah i i you have one of the you've just described brand or the value of brand in one of the most eloquent ways yet it's probably what i was trying to get across in the chapter but didn't do quite so well it is all (laughs) about opportunity it's all about creating opportunity and look, you, I, one of the things I say in the book is digital obscurity will be the plague of the commoner in the future. Mm-hmm. We are so, we are being so conditioned that we have to find what we want in Google. And if we don't, we don't trust it. So by default, not, if you don't have one in the future, not only will you not have opportunities, but you're going to start losing opportunities. It's going to start to contract because someone's like, well, why can't I find any, this accountant? I can't find anything. He's got a LinkedIn page with three followers. No, this makes me nervous. Something's wrong here. You have to walk your talk. I think that's important. And I think it's funny. It's also a generational thing. I'll also tell you this. When I talk to baby boomers sometimes, or when we have companies with, you know, board of directors and so forth that I've talked to, and it's funny, there's a generational difference where I think a lot of baby boomers grew up thinking that marketing or personal branding or all these things were kind of icky, like, you know, it was like, it was the sizzle without the steak sort of thing. And that's blatantly not true, but I think the new, right, and I talk about this in Momentum too, is the new paradigm is really, no, you have to walk the talk. It's not enough. You, the cobbler's kids can't, you can't say like, oh, the cobbler's kids don't have shoes, right? No, the cobbler's kids are modeling those damn shoes on Instagram. <laughs> yes, I loved it. The cobbler's kids are modeling those shoes on Instagram. Someone keep that out. That was the bomb right there. But it's true, right? There's no hiding anymore. No. You can't hide. So if you can't hide, you might as well shine. Right, so so I, I agree. I, like I talk to a lot of. Sorry. I do. I really like that. You know, you if you can't hide, you might as well shine. I think that I think we got a new bio for your Twitter line and your name, the title of your next book, Keenan. <laughs> right, right. There you go. I got to remember that. Kiki, make notes. I got to remember that one. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's interesting because I am on the cusp of baby boomer Gen X, and so a lot of my friends who saw me doing this early, where I was like, "What are you doing, this Keenan, with a social blah blah blah?" And now they're like, "Oh wow, Keenan." You know, tell me what to do. And I start telling them, like, oh, it's too much. I don't have time. I, I don't get it. It's not working for me. So how, how would you recommend for anybody, you know, a boomer, a Gen X, or even a millennial, how to get started? How, what's the first step? Okay, so Keenan told me to do it in this book. Shama just, she built this amazing company called Marketing Zen. She's got all of these clients. She's speaking all the way. These two cats have done it. What do I do and how do I start? Very simple. Very simple. Provide value to the audience that you wish to influence. I mean, that's that's the summary, right? And I mean, it's funny because when I started, and here's the thing, people always think it's content creation. It doesn't have to be content creation. One of the principles, again, that I talk about in Momentum, and I'm just 
I'm like excited that the book is proving to be so relevant right now to these conversations is content curation and how important that is. You don't have to be the expert, but can you be the filter for your audience? And that's powerful. I mean, think about this, Keenan, right? You create all this content, but one of the things that gives your brand an advantage is that you have me and other people that, you know, you respect sharing their perspective with your audience. It's, it's not a perspective of like, oh, like it's, it's a very different take on, hey, my job is to provide my audience with the best value. That means guests. That means curating other people's content. That means sharing stuff that's going to be helpful for them doesn't have to be mine. So, you know, when I first started in marketing, remember, I was 20, shoot, 22 years old, 20. I started my first blog, I think, when I was 21, 22. And <laughs> honestly, didn't have all that much to say, you know? It's it, it like, uh, I was like, okay, what am I going to put out there that's going to be a value? Like, who who am I, right, in this yeah, big yeah, world? Yeah. But then I thought, thought, you know, I started to go to conferences. So I remember one of my first conferences that I went to was Blog World, uh, which Blog World was so small at the time. It was just in Vegas and it was a couple hundred people. Now, of course, they've like it on two coasts. And anyways, it was a very good conference. I think this was like 07. But I went there and what I did was I attended all these sessions and I took copious amounts of notes. I took copious amounts of notes and then I shared them on my blog. I was like, hey, this was everything I learned in this session. And then... I met other people at the conference and I was like, listen, I'm taking a lot of these notes. If you want to give me your card, I'll email you my notes. And so it's it's like very basic <laughs> stuff, right? So my initial content was not my like my brilliant ideas. I didn't, I mean, it took me a long time until I got to the point where I was like, okay, I have something to add to the conversation. Mm -hmm. For a while, I was simply framing the conversation and showcasing the conversation. And that's okay. That is totally okay to do. Uh, again, it was all about value for the audience. What I'm interpreting here, to create another one-liner, is you, you executed a give strategy, right? I, you, I, think, I think branding, in essence, is, is a give strategy, right? Personal branding. It's funny. I think they should call it like interpersonal branding because it's mm -hmm. not about you. The only way you, you brand yourself, and that's almost like a side effect. It's all you get branded <laughs> yeah, because you, of what brand you, you get branded. That's a great you point. You get branded and you get branded by interpersonal value, right? Like what you put out there. So it's not the person that goes around waving the largest banner like I'm awesome. It's the things that you do. I mean, that's how legends are made. I mean, think like this. It's funny. You look to history, right? It's not the people who have been writing these huge autobiographies. It's the things that they've done that other people talk about. And so I think that I, to me, that was always something that was really apparent. And to, to this point, you know, I like the team jokes, I always call myself a chief value officer. And I, I mentioned that even in like my, you know, my LinkedIn bio, because I'm like, look, I have three constituents. I serve my employees, my job to give them a good culture. Like you said, cultures, everyone has a culture. How good I make it, that's on me as a leader. My clients, making sure that we're ahead of the curve so they can rest easy and they know we got this, right? And then my broader audience, this like million people around the globe who read my tweets and buy the books and like watch the videos. And it's it, so that's how I see my job. And so I think personal branding is very much about creating value and, and sharing value. You know, it, it, I like how you said that the chief value officer, um, I call myself the chief antagonizer. <laughs> the same, right? The same type of yeah, concept. Yeah, you shape things up, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I argue, you know, you can't create change unless you're willing to shake things up, right? When mm -hmm. you change our clothes, you put them in the wash. We wash our clothes, we put them in the wash. What does it do? It agitates them, right? It, right. So, um, yeah. So I love that. I love that. All right. So here I am. We know that it's important now. We know that we need to start small. I think there's a confidence issue with people. How do you help people address the confidence issue? I think you touched on it a little in your answer, but let's go a little deeper because what I'm doing right now, for the last bit of this, is I'm picturing the people listening on iTunes and I'm hearing listening to people uh, watching this on YouTube when we're done. And they're mm -hmm. like, okay, I got it. But they're just still struggling, right? To just take the leap and have the confidence to know that they have the value. Because you're a confident person, right? You, you just had the confidence to know and go for it. So how, how do we help people take that first step? And how do we help build the confidence? I'll say two things. I think confidence is earned and it's cultivated over time. 
I don't think it's a given. People think like, oh, how can you be confident? Yeah, people aren't born confident. I think a certain early childhood can help, but confidence comes from knowing that you have something of worth to, you know? And so confidence is earned. It's it's what you, it's what comes naturally, I think, after a lot of hustle and a lot of hard work and blood and sweat. I don't think it's just a, I don't think it's, I, I will say this, I think it's a byproduct of the things that you do. And you can cultivate it again by finding things that you are proud of and also celebrating the little wins. I think that makes a difference, right? And so if it's a matter of I'm doing good work, but you know, I'm just not sure if it's if it's awesome or you know, you I think have to find a way to celebrate the little wins to kind of boost that confidence. But that's I I don't even think confidence is the right word for that. I think that's more of a you know your your own self belief, but confidence, like true confidence, comes from knowing what the heck you're doing. So when I get up on stage to give a key- keynote, people are like, oh, you're so confident up there because I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. you put me up on stage and and you tell me, you know, hey, talk about like you know astronomy, talk about. Yeah, that is not going to be a confident shaman up there. Like, I don't know what I'm doing, right? So mm-hmm. confidence comes from not necessarily faking it until you make it, but by putting in the man hours. I mean, I'm confident now because of how much work I put into my talks, how much work I do before I, you know, give give a talk. And so I, it comes it comes from hard work. I, I, I really do think that. Um, the perception of confidence is another thing. But true sure. confidence is a different thing. So there's bravado, which I think you can't fake until you, know, you feel it kind of inside. And there's all kinds of studies and there's nothing wrong with that, like rah-rah and getting yourself riled up. And like, yeah, I, I, that is bravado and there is a time and place for it. But I think true confidence is something that comes <clears throat> after you've done it tons. And people will say like, oh, you're so good on camera. It's natural. I'm like, you should see my earlier stuff. <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah, it, yeah, comes yeah, yeah, yeah. Practice. it comes through being and I, I yeah it does and I will say I'm very I'm I feel very lucky and blessed because I got into being on the public stage from a very young age so I did oratory in high school I competed on the national level so most speakers do, do, don't, don't have that background so I do feel I was very lucky to have that exposure and if you have kids by all means you know I think like speech and debate amazing like communication is so key in everything that you you do it's something that i wish more people would encourage their kids to do even if, if that's not like a natural strength it's communication in general is such an important thing true true completely agree completely agree so when one of the things that jumps out is you talk about this idea of confidence and getting small wins i believe that self-awareness is absolutely at the core to that right I have to be aware with who I am, what my strengths and weaknesses are. I have to be honest with myself about the amount of effort I'm putting in or not putting in. You know, do you believe that to be the case? And where do you think self-awareness plays a role in building this confidence and then begin to take that first step? Yeah, I, I think self-awareness is, is huge. I mean, you always play to your strengths. I think that's, you know, what I always, I joke that being an entrepreneur is for people who are editors, not perfectionists. Because the idea is that you're always able to go back to to making tweaks and and making things better. But perfectionism cripples you because, you know, in the digital age, here's a tip. You're never done. It's never final. You know, when I first got into this, when when one of our first clients at the agency was they wanted this website, right? And And this lady would take just weeks to pick out, like, the right magenta. And it was just so, I, and, and I tried to explain to her, like, listen, you know, it's not, it's not gonna, it's not gonna make a huge difference to the end goal. Like, what do you, but it was just, she was so precise in what she wanted. It took her to her own, you know, to, it took her a year to get her website done. And by the time it was launched, there was a whole new, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's only yeah, it didn't even make the, the magenta didn't even work on the breath. It was just funny. So it was just, it's one of those things that I think iteration is 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 your best friend, and part of that is yeah playing to your child, playing to your strengths, you know bolstering your weaknesses where you can. I do it with staff. Like I 
I have people on my team who are much, you know, much better than I am at a lot of things. Most things don't tell them that <laughs> most <laughs> things. And, um, and I rely on them heavily. And again, I work to my strengths. Like I'm not chief operations out. Like I, you wouldn't want me in that role, you know, you, <laughs> that's not what you, you don't want me doing that. So Amen. you, you want me doing what I do best. And then, you, leveraging that to help the company grow. And I think that's true across the board. You've got to play to your strengths. All right. So I, I love that. So here we are. I'm learning about my strengths. I start reaching out and this could be a little tactical and, and I have my own opinions on this, but I want to hear yours. Like what platforms or better yet, how, what platforms should people start considering to building this brand? And then also how should they determine what platforms to use? Right. So I think it, it's two things. One, it's this is your primary thing you take into consideration, your audience. Where is your audience? Two, what's your comfort level? I think it matters. I mean, I, I would never force someone to, to do video if that's not their thing. You know, if they're going to feel so uncomfortable with the camera on, I don't care if video gets more views than anything. Like, it's, it's not going to work for them. So I do think there's something to be said about finding what's your comfort level. But primarily, where's your audience? If you're B2B, LinkedIn. LinkedIn, baby. Build up that profile. Get those recommendations. You know, it's amazing how much stuff I've done on LinkedIn. And LinkedIn keeps, like, highlighting me and their stuff. <laughs> they, they listed me as, like, a millennial, you know, in marketing expert in their profile. Like the other day, they tweeted me that they had me on their blog showcasing, like, my profile. So I didn't plan on – again, I didn't plan on all that. I was just building up my LinkedIn. If you're B2B, LinkedIn, it's a great platform. It's, you know, you can now publish on it. And it's crazy. I publish on the LinkedIn platform. I have 88,000 something followers, maybe more, maybe 120,000 or something. But it's like, okay, great. I, I use that platform all the time. You have to be smart about it. I don't create, honestly, original content for that. I take what I'm already creating and share with my LinkedIn community. We so, are like two peas in a pot. We exact same strategy here. At the <laughs> I can't keep up. I mean, if I had to write new content for everything, I'd die. So those of you who are building a brand and saying, what do I do next? Shama just gave you permission. I gave you permission to repurpose your content. Oh, totally. oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah totally, creation totally, yeah. and distribution. Creation and distribution. <laughs> oh, we, I, 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 yes. We got a funny guy on here. It's going to be interesting. Like this. Yeah, they're called stalkers, bud. Um <laughs> Um, so, so, all right. So I love the idea to go to where your audience is, right? So uh, if it's B2B, go to LinkedIn. Where would you suggest if it's B2C? Yeah, B2C, you know, I mean, if you are, for example, a makeup artist and that's your jam, Instagram, you know, YouTube, and you have got to figure out, you know, what Pinterest depends on what your audience is. Is it visual? Is it not visual? What is Again, like you're, you know, are you serving 18 to 24 year olds Snapchat? Like, what is your audience? And you go where they, and you go where they are. Um, you know, there's a question about like using for syndication. I use syndication for, I mean, we use different platforms and such, but I use people. <laughs> so, I mean, we have Hootsuite and we use Buffer app and all these things, but uh, for, I handle all my own social, my Twitter accounts. I handle all my, um, I, you know, I, I can't go through all my Facebook comments, but I do a lot of that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we do use platforms, but again, a lot of it's strategic. It's not mindless. I do not automate my posts. I think that can get very, very tricky. No, I do not. Well, okay. When you say you don't automate your posts, go a little deeper. What do you mean by that? Um, I don't, I don't put pre-made tweets out there just because I, you know, I feel like social in so many ways is real time. There's a place in, in time where that's appropriate, but for my personal accounts, I just don't. Oh, okay. What about, well, I'll be, I'm too in the weeds, so I'm going to move past that. I'm going to move past that. So what do you think about the idea of um, people coming together? So you use the example of an account, Right. What if you? What do you think of the idea of, of an account reaching out to a bunch of his other accountant friends and trying to work together to yeah. drive their brand, share each other's stuff, and and create sort of a I don't know a pack, for lack of a better word. Yeah. So actually, that's the ha ha fifth principle from the book Momentum, and I t I call I call that cross pollination, right? And it's about seeing opportunities where you didn't see opportunities before. 
And I don't just mean with, I mean, yes, you could partner with other accountants, but this is even looking at and partnering with your lawyer buddy because you both work with small businesses and that makes all the sense in the world, right? You have the same audience and guess what? Businesses that you're helping protect from a legal standpoint also have financial needs. And so it's really about kind of finding those partnerships and, and curating those. I love that idea of not being, see, I, you know, you talked about me, you being tactical and me being tactical. I get so tactical and linear that sometimes I miss those associations. I, you know, so that was does. Really, that's the thing, Kenan, everybody does. And that's why it's something that you proactively, like I tell people, you know, make a list of your clients, make a list of your vendors, make a list of your employees, your partners, and then see where there's opportunities. I mean, people don't even realize your employees are your best, like, force. Yeah. You know, which to me is just amazing how it's not utilized. But like our own team, every time we do a blog post, when we take that, it gets shared in the lobby, right? And like a little Slack chat. And everyone's encouraged to share that, like pre-made tweet, there's the link ready to go. I mean, we see like record high traffic when we engage our whole team. And it's not mandatory, but they want to share it. Why? Because it's a win-win. Makes the company they work for look good. It makes them look like they're smart and providing good value. So it, yeah. they're, they're not picking and choosing. No, you're absolutely right. It, it blows my mind how little organizations, especially bigger organizations, use their employees to drive the message. It blows and, and my mind. Yeah, and, and, and how many don't? I mean, I'm like, you, need the, you don't even have to be a huge organization to do it, honestly. Now, how many don't is what blows my mind. How many don't? Oh, I'm in full agreement oh. with you. It's a huge, yeah, huge yeah. missed opportunity. <laughs> huge missed opportunity. Totally. You know, here's one for anybody, and it's not quite on the brand, but it is on the brand. I'm going to throw this out, and then I'll let you tell me what you think. But off the fly, right now, off the fly, if you work for a big company or a medium-sized company, and you have any sphere of influence, so you're a manager, a director, even an individual contributor, your ability to go rally a handful of people in your organization to promote and drive just your organization is going to accelerate your brand, and it could actually um, – blow you up inside your own company as everybody starts saying, what is going on around Tammy's group? Why is all this stuff coming out from there? That in itself could be an amazing opportunity. What do you think of that? If you don't wait, but go do. Totally. I, and I think, I think the key thing is there is ownership. Ownership. When you take ownership of something beyond just your task list, I tell my team this all the time. I said, listen, the success of Zen that's your responsibility. That's everyone's responsibility. It's not just a task list. It's not a job. You know, it's not like it is the health of the overall company and being able to contribute to that. Yes, I like that. I like that a lot. And then as a contributor, back to the value piece, right, then you benefit by providing value to a bigger cause. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So. What would you say are some of the biggest pitfalls of people's person branding? What do they want to steer clear of? What do we want people to know they shouldn't be doing? Shouldn't be doing. Don't be inconsistent. I think that's tough. So I guess the flip side of it is do be consistent. Personal brands are not built overnight. I'm amazed at how many people are like, oh, wow, you know, it's, it's so cool. And I'm like, you have no idea like how much work goes into all of this, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so... You have to stay consistent. I think that's absolutely key. For example, I have a column with Forbes and I have a column with Inc. And people are like, oh, that's so cool. How'd you get those columns? I'm like, uh, it took me like two years of meeting with the right people, of creating content, of guest posting for them, of driving traffic, of showing that, you know, my content was worthy. Like, it's so funny. It's like you don't you don't get these things automatically. And a lot of you, there's a lot of groundwork that has to be done. So I think thinking of personal branding as a one shot thing is a pitfall, not being consistent. Um, and I would say another pitfall is diluting it too much. It's one thing for you to have interest and be a good human being um, and a well-rounded individual. It's another that when you mix up your audiences, like you will rarely see me share anything personal on social media. And I mean, like if I'm out at a restaurant with friends, I don't post that. Some of that's like, yes, I want to, you know, that's my part of my life and I don't care to necessarily share that. But the other is my audience. It's like, I don't think they really care what I'm eating right now. 
what they want to know is when we publish the next blog post on my Facebook Live is going to be the hottest thing. That's what. So it's like it's 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 got to be a consideration of okay, what's your brand? What's the image? What is the audience going to appreciate? And not that I don't share. I mean, I share my travels. I share a lot of things, but I I try to find a way to make them valuable rather than just like here is a turkey sandwich. <laughs> Here's a tur- All right, that's good. That's good. That's good. Here's a turkey sandwich. I like that. Um, I agree with you on that. I love the idea about the uh, of, of yes. Yeah, so what I want to say this. I believe, and you just described it, is that building a strong personal brand is a marathon, and it's not even every stride at a time. It's like every quarter of a stride. It's just one tiny, tiny effort built on another, built on another. One blog post, one tweet. One thank you to a person on Pinterest, one mm-hmm. comment answered, another blog post, and slowly but surely it starts to build. Yes? Yeah. I think that the key is to keep swinging. That's what it comes down to. Keep swinging. Got it. Love it. Keep swinging. Keep on going. All right. Uh, oh, poor James. We have James here with Plex. He is his poor internet signal, but we'll see. James, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hi, James. Hi, Shama. Hi, Keenan. It's real good to see you guys again. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for hosting this. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I have a question for you, Shama. I'm I'm an sure. entrepreneur myself. Um, well, I don't know if I like that word entrepreneur. I know Keenan hates it. Um, but uh, I, I run my own business. Um, I'm in the I'm in the process of, like you said, building that personal brand, doing what I need to be doing. Um, that's where a lot of my questions come from. One, where do I do CRM? Like, what do I do for CRM? I know Keenan uses HubSpot. For example, HubSpot's really expensive. So for someone like myself, who doesn't necessarily have that budget, what do you recommend? Um, as well as how do you overcome rejection? Like, uh, like I, I posted my question, you know, I, I send out a lot of proposals and people are like, well, we don't think it's really that great. We'd like to go somewhere else and or go with another thing. I don't know. When they give me an answer like that, how do I ask for more feedback or how do I get more information so I know what to change? And I'll sure, take my answer sure. off. Yeah. Okay, sure. Yes. Yeah. So I think a couple of questions. In terms of CRM, um, Keenan, did you put Nimble in there? Is that like a tool you're yeah. recommending? Okay. Yeah. Free and it's phenomenal, but that's, yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. I mean, it depends on what you're trying to do. I don't use HubSpot. I mean, we have clients who we use it for. Uh, but like I said, I... I do things as manually as possible and it's a little old school, but I, to me, it's more about the impact, not necessarily the automation side of things. Uh, Buffer app is a good one. Hootsuite is another one. So you do have options. It just depends. What is it? What are you trying to accomplish? I think that's what makes, you know, that's what makes a huge difference. Um, Yeah. Great, great questions though, by the way, the other thing I will say about rejection is, you know, everyone gets rejected. That's like, part of that's far for the course i will say that building a brand where business comes to you is is a whole different experience right because we don't do a lot of outbound proposals rarely and that's only if they actually come to us like if they request a proposal and we've talked to them but we don't do outbound sales we don't do outbound like we don't do any cold calling we don't sell cold like emails that's not it, it does. It's not a fit for us, and it's not what we want. What changes when you have a good brand? When people, for example, respect you as a design expert or whatever it may be, they seek you out. They want your expertise, right? And it changes. It changes everything because when someone comes to us, we're not talking to them about why we're right for the job. They came to us. <laughs> they already feel like we have a name in the industry. They. I mean, we're not sitting there and trying to sell ourselves, right? We. I always joke that. We don't try to convert people. We just baptize those who are ready. Like it's always been my <laughs> always been my fault. Yeah, like, if you come here and try to tell me that you want me to convince you why social media and why you should be a household name, I'm not gonna do that. Like, no, you know, because I got 10 other people who already get it, who get the importance of that. What they want to do is let's do this. How do we do this? Um, I think it also decreases your sales cycle a lot because. We skip that part. We don't go through the, you know, the proposals and like the usual, you know, schlepping, if you will. We skip more to the, you came to us. Here's how we can help. Here are ideas. Here's what, you know, here's the investment. Let's do this. 
Um, and I mean, again, it's really funny. A lot of times we get companies trying to pitch us, like, please take on our project. We know you guys are busy. And it's an enviable, enviable position to be in, I'll tell you that. But yes, it does come from building up your expertise. We focus a lot on case studies. You'll find tons on our website. So we do good work and we, we believe in showcasing that. I absolutely loved, loved that phrase. We don't try to convert people. We try to baptize them when they're ready. That was freaking <laughs> awesome. Get religious people to do that. It'd be a beautiful world. <laughs> and imagine if we take every Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, and Jewish, well, Jewish people don't do that. Actually, that's what makes Judaism so cool. They don't try to convert. But everybody else, you stop trying to convert and just be ready to baptize whatever your equivalent is when they show up. What a great world. Think of how many wars we wouldn't have. Think about how much beautiful the world would be. So I love that. I'm going to steal that, Shana. I'm You're stealing. welcome to steal it, Keenan. Boom. Now that you say I can do it, it's not stealing anymore. I feel nice. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, all right. I want to introduce Christina Evans. Christina is a – I'll let her describe – I know what she does, but as it relates to a sales guy, she read Not Taught about three, four, five months ago and has just become a full-fledged apostle. And she Hi, has changed – Hi, Shama. Changed the world. So I'm glad to have her on. Christina, jump in. What do you got for us? Oh, this is a good one. Uh, yeah, I, I really like your style, Shama. I think that um, it's very inspiring to me because I also don't really like to utilize um, automation. I'm really into manual processes and making sure that I'm authentically engaging with people. Um, so I guess my question to you is um, I've kind of been going full throttle for the last, uh, like Keenan said, like four or five months. Um, have you ever gotten burnt out? And what do you do or what are, I guess, what's in your routine that kind of keeps you full throttle? Yeah, I get burnt out all the time. I think people who say they don't are lying. I mean, really, it's, it's just not true. I like, you're human, of course. And the speed of at which I work, of course, like, my the thing is my batteries go at 100 and so it's like the energizer bunny but they drain a lot faster too because i'm like all my apps are running <laughs> you know yeah. i'm not very good at i know keenan you're this way i'm not like i don't usually run on low power mode that's why you know hence mm. you get sick right <laughs> because i'm not very good at like going slower in a, in a lot of ways and that's a weakness and i admit it i will say this i think it's the simple things i think people i think burnout is um it's a symptom it's a symptom for sure but i think it's also how much power you give it right like i feel like there's plenty of days i'm totally burned out i go to sleep i wake up and i'm ready to go again so it's it's <laughs> you know i i think and sometimes you need a little more you need a vacation you need you might need to step away totally you might need to go to a conference where you can be re-inspired and, and reignited and re-engaged it might mean you read a book that's totally, you know, motivational in your industry, or it might be that you do something totally different to disconnect. I think it's a very personal thing. Um, but yeah, I get burnt out all the time. It happens, you know, there's times where I'm like, why do I do this again? Remind me, like, you know, can I be a CMO somewhere? And like, I mean, just all these things. But of course, at the end of the day, I know that's not true. And I, I love what I do. Um, but that's, but that's not to say that I don't, I don't feel burnt out, or I don't, you know, you just, you have to be able to do, you have to self-care for sure. As an entrepreneur, and can you don't like that word, but like as an entrepreneur, as a business person, as really just people living in the digital age, you have to find ways to self-care and self-soothe. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. It makes me feel good that I'm not the only one that's like, uh, you're I not, just need to like turn it all off. No, you're not, you you're not, not the only one at all. And there's no shame in that. There's no shame in that. I mean, people are like, oh yeah, you should be working 24-7. No, you should work for what works for you. And everyone is different. And so I, I'm not a fan of blanket advice like that. Like everyone's goals are different. Everyone wants different things out of life. And, you know, there's there's no there's no rule book. You're not doing it wrong there because there's no right way to do it. You know, there's best practices and things that work for other people. But you got to find what works for you. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Got, and Christina, I will add this, though. You have what I think a trap people get into is 
they let the pendulum swing too far one way. And what they'll do on the, on the burnout side is, well, I'm just working too hard. I'm just too burned out. And they reduce their workload so it no longer aligns with their end goals. So if you have a set of goals that you want to achieve and they require a certain amount of effort, you have to figure out how to put that effort in in a way that allows you not to burn out or to minimize the burnout. Because at the end of the day, no matter who you ask, if you talk to, you know, Michael Phelps or Lindsey Vaughn or Tiger Woods, these people, there was no way they could get to the goals they wanted without putting in massive amounts of work. What they had to figure out was how do I put that work in in the most productive way possible so I don't burn out or I minimize the burnout. Don't fall into the trap. It's a lot of people are like, oh, this is really hard, but, but when I'm burnt out, so I'm taking a break and they become unaligned. And then they no longer can actually reach the goals because they're now lying to themselves. There's a lot of, um, I wish what I'm looking for. Um, uh, oh, it'll come to me in a second. Self-justification, for lack of a better word. Okay, no, I think that's sound advice too. I think it's about also just kind of taking a step back and make sure that all the activity that you're pushing out is working towards those goals too. Yes. Yes. So, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, sister. Awesome to see you. Love it. Appreciate it. In here. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Thanks for your question. All right, Shama. So someone said that I hate the word entrepreneur. I actually don't mind the word entrepreneur. What I hate is the self-proclaimed entrepreneur. And here's why. I wrote a blog post. I'll find it to you. you. In my opinion, you're not an entrepreneur until you've had to pay payroll. Okay? So there are <laughs> entrepreneurs who pay payroll and they have, and it's the one, I don't know about you, but I know for me, for a fact, it's the one time of the month, every month that my bank account takes the biggest hit. Woof. And then the bills come in and woof, right? So the idea of payroll, you're not an entrepreneur if you don't know payroll. You can be a solopreneur and there's nothing wrong with that. And I was one for a while. I think it's awesome. But again, until you have to live with paying other people's mortgages and you have to live with paying other people's car payments, you're not an entrepreneur. And then the other person is entrepreneur wannabes. They work for somebody else and they're talking about being entrepreneurs, but they're completely embedded in the safety net. They get a paycheck every week. If the thing doesn't work, they still get up and go to the office. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it was my reaction to a lot of the social media stuff going on around, I'm an entrepreneur. No, you're not. Until you sign someone's paycheck, you're a solopreneur or entrepreneur wannabe, but you are not an entrepreneur. <laughs> um, that is an interesting perspective, Keenan, and I understand where you would, how you would come to that. All right, what's your take on it? Come on, that was so political. We can't be political here. What is your take on it? How do you view it? I think entrepreneurship is a very broad word. I, I do think there's the, I do agree with the entrepreneurs and wannabepreneurs, and I do think that once you are responsible for someone else's livelihood, it's a whole different level, right? Um, I, I do agree with that for sure. I think it's funny, you know, when I speak, a lot of times they'll say, oh, we, you know, the thing that kind of really wanted, we wanted you is, is one of the things is that you run a company, right? It's different. I and mean, they're like, a lot of speakers out there are, are, are great, not to say that they're not, but it's theoretical, right? It's, it's like they're talking about things that they haven't necessarily done and again there there's lots of ways in which you can do that and, and provide value but for me i think yeah it, it is it's a different feeling intrinsically to know that you have livelihoods depending on you and and being able to to live with that it's a different dynamic it's understanding what that means um and i think that's hard to understand fully unless you've been there you're doing that so yeah i i feel you on that i mean as far as semantics go i think entrepreneurship is a pretty broad word and and i'm okay with it being an umbrella term because frankly it is an umbrella term right but i do agree with the wannabepreneurs and and you know the you can you have a lot of uh nuances and of course there's intrapreneurs you don't have to have your own company to be entrepreneurial Right. I, I do believe that, that. Idea, you can yeah. you can do a lot of great like a lot of my team, you know, a lot of my employees, they're ex entrepreneurs, they had their thing wasn't for them, nothing wrong with that. But they definitely have that sense of ownership and wanting to get yeah. things done and that hustle. And that is something I admire. Yes, I will, I will totally agree with you that you could absolutely be entrepreneurial, no question asked. Um, and we have one person who wants to call in. Do you have one more minute? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Aiden, I hope I'm saying that right. Come on in, my man, Mr. Sweeney. Let's hope we can get connected. 
So no, I agree with you on that. But you're just so much nicer than me. I, you know, like I said, I'm the chief antagonizer, man. I got to, you know, I had to put a squash and everybody running around saying they're entrepreneurs all the time. Hey, hey sweetie, my man, how are you? Welcome to Taught Lead hey. Series. How are you doing? Hi. Hi. Awesome, Actually, it's not really a, uh, a question, but a comment, but Sham, I just really wanted to say thank you for all the value you share. I follow you on other platforms. You're oh, really, really helpful. That. Thank and you. And everything you've written and that you've shared, it's really helped me a lot. So I just want to say yes. thank you so much for all your work and for everything you do for all of us to help us. So really I appreciate, appreciate that. it. Thank and I just you. wanted to to tell you thanks so much as a for me. That's it. I don't really thank have a you. question, but no, just want to say that's, that. But that's really appreciated. Thank you so much. And you know, like there's so much to be said about people who will take the time and make the effort to let someone else know that their work about makes sure. you know because a lot of times like you know Kina and I we're working away in our offices. It's two a.m. You're like, is anybody ever like, yeah. is anybody out there? Do you, you know, is this is is this useful? And so that kind of feedback, even like you know, when they speak and someone takes the time to wait and just to oh, say they yeah. don't have a question, but I just wanted to let you know I appreciated that. I mean, to me, it's like your mama raised you right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you not know? everybody comments and so on, or gives a like or a thumbs up, but. Yeah. From, from coming from just to let you know there are people out there who really appreciate <laughs> all the help you give thank us. you so thank that's you it. And, it, and it is very appreciated and it makes my day thank you Aiden. okay you're welcome that's it i won't take your time anymore thank you bye oh, you're the man that was that was a solid baby well done sweetie well done brother <laughs> so listen uh in closing, we've come that time everybody you have been listening to not taught taught leader series lesson 10 with shama Hyder how to build a brand new. Shama, how do you want people to walk away from this? What do you want them to leave here thinking about and doing? Um, you know, I would say for me, it's always better to take one small step than a lot of theory that you're not going to do anything with. So even if that means you go and you update your LinkedIn headline, if that means you go back and spend some time over lunch thinking about what kind of value do you really want to provide to the world? How do you, you know, so it's, I would encourage people to think about how what we've talked about applies to their situations and then find even just a small way to implement something, just a baby step. And I think that makes it so, you know, their, their time wasn't wasted. It was, it was valuable. They got something out of it. I love that. I love that. And can I add to your advice, then repeat? Then repeat, yeah, keep, don't stop. <laughs> yes, because yes. I really like what you said, but I kept waiting for them, and then repeat, and then repeat. Oh, and yeah, 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 mm -hmm. sure, yeah, don't stop believing. You can cue that now, Kira. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Well, listen, everybody, I, again, I want to thank Shama Haida for showing up here on Top Leaders Lesson 10. She is actually in the back of the book. So for those of you who have it, which is many of you as you are part of the Not Taught Tribe, she is in the back with her information. You can find her at marketingzen.com. You can find her at Shama on Twitter. Her new book is called Momentum. You need to go get it. Um, and folks, if those of you who are not on the newsletter, get on the Top Tribe newsletter. Kiki will put it in the things here. If you're on iTunes, please give us, tell us what you think. I don't care if it's a one or a five. I'm all about the feedback and it helps. Leave a comment if you're on YouTube. And guys, till next time, listen, the 21st century has changed everything. Grab a hold or you'll be left behind. And what do we come up with today, Shama? You can't hide, so you might as well shine. Well shine. I like it. It's your new tagline. <laughs> Thanks, Kenan. Thanks for having me. Thank you, sister. Really appreciate it. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.